taking this opportunity to get some of Phil's thoughts on music, on tape, the saxophone, and life in general. Um, he's always talking about his teacher, Lindemann, how he used to smack him around and push him and beat him up and uh, impart his wisdom. And we always wish we had a videotape of that, so I'm trying to clear that up. Um, Phil, why don't you take and tell us your background, some of your history, how did this all start? Well, most of it started alike. We all were in the Depression, young people trying to play music, and there weren't, wasn't any money to buy a horn. So you would play for a police band, Boy Scout band, American Legion band, anybody who gave you a free instrument. So I played the mellophone, then I played the sousaphone, I even played with the Columbia University band. I didn't know what I was doing, carrying the sousaphone around, and I marched between bottles milk bottles. And uh, then I got, I was playing violin most of the time. And then Rudy Valley became famous. And Guy Lombardo became famous. And I was just a kid who listened to them on the air. And I would try to imitate what I heard. And finally I got a band together. And the first band, the saxophone player walked out on me before I could play this Chinese American restaurant. And uh, I lost the job. So I vowed that I would get my own saxophone. Mm -hmm. So I went to New York and I traded my violin at a pawn shop for saxophone. I came back and we played and it sounded terrible. I had bought the wrong saxophone. I bought a C melody and I was trying to play B flat parts and E flat parts. <laughs> so everybody was really laughing because it was the worst sound you could possibly hear. I took it back to New York and it was so busy they didn't really care. And I traded the saxophone back for a, a violin. Turned out to be I picked up a very good violin. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I wanted to play the saxophone and I was very fortunate because a man by the name of Herman Yorks, who played in the uh, ABC Orchestra of Whiteman, he was a friend of my father's and he, I was going to New York to look at saxophones. He said, oh, I'll take you to buy a saxophone. I had $35. And he took me into Cannes and I bought an old now people love it. It's a con. It's a beautiful old con and I bought it for thirty-five dollars. And that was my first horn. And I didn't know too much about intonation or anything. Anyhow, now I have to have lessons. The same man, I talked to him and I said, well I'm going in to study with Merle Johnson. He says, no you're not. You're going to study with a new guy by the name of Henry Lindemann who has absolutely wonderful new ideas about saxophone playing. Now it's very important to remember that saxophone is the newest of all the instruments. Mm -hmm. And so clarinet players were teaching saxophone players how to play. And it never worked. We know now that you can teach somebody to play clarinet if they play the saxophone quite well. So I took, he took me in and I, I went to my first lesson, had to come in from Long Beach, New York, Long Island, to New York City, which was a real, it's like coming up, going a pass, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. It took a, it's a long time and very expensive to get into New York. And I took my first lesson and I remember one of the first things he said to me is, I really don't need you. I, I don't know if I want to teach you at all. He said, I don't like talented people. They never get anywhere. He said, I'll get somebody, half your talent will work and he'll be much better musician than you no matter what. Oh, I was 17 maybe and I had tears in my eyes and I said, oh, give me one week for goodness, just one week. Mm -hmm. All right, one week we'll see how you do. Mm -hmm. Well, that one week started me to playing. I was so afraid that he was going to throw me out. Mm -hmm. But I never played less than four hours a day to start with. Now I was going to high school, finishing high school, and I got good quickly. But it was interesting because all my friends could play much faster than I could play. And they were puzzled that I couldn't play their exercises. Mm -hmm. But I would say that to Henry, and Henry would say, a couple of months from now, play the same thing with them, see who plays it better. Well, they couldn't play the exercise that they had played with me, and I was reading it. Mm -hmm. And I said, something's going on here that I really don't understand. Now, Henry had a system, and he called it the closed open system. In other words, if you put your finger down, that was called a closed note. If you lift your fingers up, that was called an open note. I think it's it's the beginning of, I, I don't think he knew he was teaching Zen, and I didn't know, uh, I was teaching a form of it. 
which is to say, where does the power come from? Well, when we first started to play, every teacher thought that the power came from your diaphragm, which is true. And the opera shoe was the most important thing you had. Nobody taught you how to use your fingers, ever. And he did the reverse. He said, fingers are what guide everything. If they're dumb, then you have to be a dumb player. And so I use that with all my students, dumb fingers, dumb player. And they don't know what I'm saying, not really, because it takes years to understand that. But it's like, and I think I was talking to you about it recently and watching the Bill Moyers TV show. They talk about chi, which is energy. Now, if you take the saxophone and you realize that if you play the wrong note, and he considered an open note the wrong note, and you're putting all your energy on that note, you are not putting your energy on the correct note. So therefore, you're really at odds with yourself. Now there is a thing that happens, and there's nothing you can do about it. There are some people who are very talented, and do work very hard, and do not study this method. But they become what I call accomplished. There's a difference. You accomplish the fact that you can play a very difficult piece. That doesn't mean that you really understand the sound of it particularly, or the phrasing of it, but you can play it. And there are great examples of young people with tremendous amount of fingers mm -hmm. and they really don't know what they're doing because Lindemann's uh, basic premise was the sound has to be right before you can do anything mm -hmm. because the sound is what music is basically said so not how many notes you play but the sound mm -hmm. and you're not making music if you don't understand the sound of the note mm -hmm. which is very difficult for young people to do because saxophone player picks up a saxophone he can honk it in a couple of weeks and he wants to play in a band mm -hmm. iron players can't do it flute players can't do it fiddle players can't do it piano certainly can't do it mm -hmm. and so they go through a more rigorous training so i find in my teaching that saxophone players generally speaking are very badly taught because they don't allow themselves the chance to get taught they're out there trying to make a buck all the time. I understand that too, but they do not learn. They don't put the time in, the necessary time, to truly learn their saxophone and have the same respect for a saxophone that you would for a violin. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're rough and tumble bunch of guys. And they, you know, they, uh, I, I know friends of mine, one in particular, uh, 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 what's his name? Mitchell Lurie. And Mitchell Lurie had a clarinet in his face when he was about eight or nine years old. He didn't know to play in a band. He played in a youth orchestra, maybe. Mm -hmm. But then he went and he got a scholarship and he played four years of clarinet at Curtis Institute. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me how many saxophone players have ever done anything close to that. Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't study, which we should, we'll say, for example, like a doctor. Right. What did you do, for example? Went out playing in the 50s band. There you First go. chance I got. First chance you got. And what did you know about a saxophone? Of which is a good saxophone, we'll say, or a bad saxophone? Not much. Didn't know about the sound, which is what you're talking about. That that's really is the most important thing. Well, the thing, the genesis for the whole reasoning that Lindemann used was that he became enamored of Yasha Heifetz. Mm -hmm. In those days, Yasha was quite young too, and but coming, becoming famous. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lindemann's curiosity, which thank God he had, got the best of him. He said, how, how is it that I can't play in tune with buttons on my horn, mm -hmm. and this guy has no buttons and he plays so, so in tune so beautifully. Mm -hmm. And so he went and interviewed Yasha Heifetz, who was not a difficult person at the time, I judge, but mm -hmm. he acted in a way that kept people away. You know, they were afraid to talk to him, I guess. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Lindemann talked to him mm -hmm. and came out with two or three ideas, which I find fascinating because I don't know if very many violinists who love him ever knows or know, knew what he really was thinking and, and using in his own playing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said is, the first thing I want to do is stop moving my body when I play. I don't think it helps the playing. Mm -hmm. So he adopted a stance, and it took him sometimes minutes to do it, 
Before he was, he felt that his weight was equally distributed in all areas. Now he could play, you know. Then he said, I'm going to do something different here. I'm going to play the note and then I'm going to listen to it. A very revolutionary idea. Mm -hmm. His feeling was, I've played that note thousands of times, so I really literally know where the note is in my fingers. Mm -hmm. When I get there, if it's flat or sharp, I don't like it, I can change that so fast, my ear will hear it, that nobody will know what I did. Whereas if you're listening to the note, he said, which they taught us at the beginning, now slide to the note till you hear it. Mm -hmm. He would say, by the time I got to the note, it was too late to correct it. Mm -hmm. And so I'd have to leave the note just where it was, unfixed. I think that revolutionary idea, it was very difficult for people to pick up. Mm -hmm. What they did is they picked up and tried to imitate his sound. And he said, that's an impossible thing to do, is to imitate somebody else's sound. You may think that you're imitating it, mm -hmm. but that each person has his own inner, inner workings going on that make the sound, mm -hmm. not the outer workings. Mm -hmm. And that's why Lindemann said, I don't care about your talent or anything, because if you do have it, how do we release it? Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning for me. Of, I was always one step of a, of a, ahead of a student. I took a lesson and I taught a student when I was 18, 19 years old for 50 cents. But I learned that way by hearing the student what I couldn't do. It was reflected immediately. I was teaching it, but I couldn't do it. And I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And so that's the next thing you understand is that intellectually you might know how to do something. But unless you do it enough so that it feels right to you too and you absorb it in that manner, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Because mm -hmm. I have known two students that I, the past ten years I've taught, who knew exactly what I said and could tell a band or somebody else how to, and they couldn't do it. They, would, they never felt it, never felt what that was. Mm -hmm. Now, I used that technique with my own band. I finally had my own band, which just before World War II was a fine band. And I taught everybody in the band how to play the Lindemann system, even the drummer. Mm -hmm. His system depended, as Heifetz said, on an oval, mm -hmm. on perpetual motion. Heifetz said the most important thing in music is the motion. No matter what you do, if the motion's wrong, then you're not going to play right. Because the motion should be so strong as to practically suck you in. And you, you don't even realize you're playing. Like he used to say, when you drive a car, you don't remember how you drove the car, mm -hmm. but you do it. Mm -hmm. Because the action becomes reflex, perfect reflexes after a while. And that's what closed and open should be. Now, if you realize how your anatomy, the physiology of your face, physiognomy of your face, how it works. And you know where the muscles are in your face. Mm -hmm. And anybody can do it. I, I, I talked to a doctor when I was in the service, I remember. And uh, he loved music. So I said, how, is our, how, is our, how are our muscles in our face fixed? Where are they? What ones do we use? He says, oh, you only have some muscles in here, uh, very few down here, mm -hmm. and some muscles that come right in against it over here. Mm -hmm. He said, but, he says, well, if I were teaching a musical instrument, I would be paying a lot of attention to the top lip of anybody who played because where the, most muscles are there. Mm -hmm. Well, until Lindemann was teaching, the idea was to tighten your corner muscles and pull away from the center. Mm -hmm. So they didn't understand the theory that back then of the laser beam, the condensing, of the air to make it stronger, mm -hmm. like a hose. You open it up and the water comes out dripping. You tighten that nozzle, and woo, you get a strong sense of water, a strong airstream. That's the one thing you did for me, is you drastically changed my embouchure from a vice-like embouchure to a round embouchure, yeah. and just allowed the air and the sound and the pitch to become so much better. Um, can you talk a little bit about your feelings of playing with the embouchure being uh, very disinvolved, but at the same time working like crazy. Well, the theory is that the, and I talked to a neurologist at Caltech about that too, the theory is that the fingers 
And it's still a puzzle to a neurologist whether the finger has its own brain or not. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, they, they do send a message. Air doesn't send a message. The lips don't send a message. The fingers send the impulse that they see. I seize it. The impulse is sent to the brain from the finger. Mm -hmm. If the impulses are incorrect, then all the other impulses would be wrong, the way the diaphragm works, the way the air current works. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you are not really uh, aware, really totally aware, which you should be if you're an artist, of how you how did you produce that note? What exactly did you do? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, a law in physics that says if something goes down fast, it comes up faster. So if you're talking about closed open on a saxophone, how saxophones play, when you realize, for example, for the moment, you look at a piano, every key you put down mm -hmm. is measured exactly the same. So he has the same feeling for every key he puts down. We don't have half the problems that a piano has, really. Because we can do eight note skip by just moving a key. Mm -hmm. And I, he can't, he's got to do that skip. Mm -hmm. Yet, we do it so badly sometimes, that's out of tune. So what Lyndon was trying to say is, if you cannot, I should say it more positively, if you can connect your air current by making the finger moves perfectly, then the air current will be undisturbed. Based on what he said, going back to what Haif had said, I'm going to play the note and then do something. Mm -hmm. In other words, the name of the note is not in the lip, it's in the finger. Mm -hmm. The production of the note is in the operature, the air current. Mm -hmm. You have a system of resistances if you play an instrument. Mm -hmm. You have to find out for yourself what those resistances are. For example, we all know that if you play an open C or C sharp on a saxophone, very little resistance. The minute you put the D down, all fingers, you have a tremendous amount of resistance. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very good to teach the muscles what the differences are between those two notes and how those differences can be worked out. So that it's like an instant release of air or an instant addition of air in the terms of resistance. Because mm -hmm. basically, I feel that the horn is played with an understanding of the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. It's built on resistances. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked a little bit about the violin and how that affects your thinking on the saxophone. Uh, a lot of times in your teaching, you use the analogy of the bow right. being our air column. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that one of our ultimate responsibilities as players is to make sure that the embouchure and the fingers don't disturb the air or the bow? Exactly. Well, the arm, actually, when we play embouchure wise when you think of it, the embouchure should be almost thinking in terms of a monotone. Mm -hmm. Like you're going, not, you know, it should be like the bow just going across the strings. Mm -hmm. He said something to me which was very instructive immediately because you know I play the violin a little bit. So he said, suppose in playing the violin I gave you a very teensy bow that big. How much sound do you think you could get out of the violin? The analogy being, if you use that much air, how good can your sound be if that is not more than that going into a note? So he began to explain to us that a note is like a balloon. You have to fill it up in order for it to really play. And we all had a lot of trouble with that because he used the word play in a very um, uh, constructive way ear-wise. You had to listen to the note. Whereas you could have played the note with your finger, looked at and knew you played the note, but never have heard the note, not really, mm -hmm. how it was constructed. Mm -hmm. And so he made sure that he used the word continuously. You did not play that note. And I'd say, I played the note. <coughs> he said, you didn't. I know you didn't. What does he mean by that? He meant that, <coughs> pardon me, that I probably, in playing the note before, we'll say it's a long tone. Mm -hmm. When I made my entrance, I skipped right over the note. I went, dee, da da By going, da da I don't know how much air I put into that note. Mm -hmm. So he said, you have to know the beginning 
of every note. Mm -hmm. I thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. Once he sent me home after about seven minutes, eight minutes, because he said, you really don't know where a note begins. Go home and find out. Mm -hmm. And I come all the way from, you know, an hour's ride in, an hour's ride back. But I had 10 cents left for a chocolate and a sandwich. There you go. And that made it, man. <laughs> that made it. But go ahead. what it does is it literally takes a different kind of person to play. There are some people who are very composed and relaxed, practicing scales, chords, which I think anybody can do anyhow. You don't need me for that. You, you don't need a teacher for that. If you're studying, you know when it's a bad note, a wrong note, and you can practice that. He said, don't bother me with that. But not that he meant I shouldn't do it, but don't waste our time doing that. You can do that without a teacher. But how do you play the scale with your fingers? That's different. He made me play a C scale for hours till my fingers literally played it like I didn't think I was moving. For example, he would not let you use your arm, your hands, because he would make you droop your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Because he said, if there's tension in the forearm, it immediately inhibits the fingers. And, and they're too stiff. They're, they're, not, they're not fluid anymore. They're not relaxed. Mm -hmm. Which is obvious after a while. Mm -hmm. And so part of my studying for the first six months was relax those forearms all the time. Mm -hmm. And it, it was amazing to find out how tight your forearm arms are. I'm and here you are yes. That. Well, most people don't listen to me. Yeah. And, and it's the, sim the simple things are too simple for people. They take it like, oh, that's unimportant because it's simple. Yet the whole simple thing is the most difficult thing to do. Yeah. Putting a finger down correctly, he used the word put. You did not put. And he would drive us crazy because I think, oh, I put my finger. No, you didn't put your finger down. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd come out and we'd, the, the students would hang out together. What does he mean I didn't put my finger down? What does he mean I didn't have an oval? Mm -hmm. Well, I interpreted it by saying there are no lines in music because music never comes to an end. Lines come to ends. They may connect, go that, but then it's over. The oval always connects. It never leaves an opening in it. And so the art of filling up a glass with water so that a note looks like the glass or a test tube or a balloon mm -hmm. is an art in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Any, you would go to junior high school, kids can play all the notes, mm -hmm. they play in bands. That's not the art. Mm -hmm. The art is to take a note like a piece of clay and develop it into the finest sound you can think of. Mm -hmm. My quarrel with today's players uh, is that they're more technically influenced than they are sound influenced. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the true development of the person, the chemistry, the metabolism of that person, in how, however they want to look at it, they're not going deep inside themselves mm -hmm. to find out what is their particular sound. Mm -hmm. Because that's the connection you make with another human being, mm -hmm. is your own sound and your own voice. If the person has a very dull voice, you hardly want to hear them. Mm -hmm. How many times people go to hear a, a lecture, they say, God, I could hardly listen to that guy anymore with that droning voice of his. Well, that's the same thing with saxophone players. To me, saxophone players today, too many of them have a very droning sound. It, I can't hear any color in it. Mm -hmm. I remember listening to Arthur Rubenstein in one of his first TV uh, documentaries in which he said, He's astounded at the speed with which the young pianists play. But he asked the question, when are they going to play music? Mm. And that question is being asked more and more all the time. Unfortunately, commercialism makes such demands on a student, on a player, that they're forced to, to do some of these things uh, uh, just to keep up with the pack, so to speak. And the competition is, I don't think it's very good for everybody anymore. Because you, you really you compete against another person instead of with yourself. I think the story is told that one of Heifetz's students wanted to uh, go into a competition and Heifetz said, no, he'd give him the money instead so that he could stay studying with him all the time. Because hmm. he said competition is not what music is about. It's not a competitive thing. And it, right. it has become mm -hmm. very competitive because the industry itself, you talk about records, etc. And, and the amount of money that's paid to a star at an amphitheater. Mm -hmm. So it's very big, big money now. 
And I understand that, you know, but that doesn't stop me from trying to inculcate in my students a real sense of honesty and integrity in their playing. Because that's the kind of growth that I believe goes forever. Mm -hmm. A musician, like an artist, and you look at the good ones, you know, these guys were playing and playing beautifully into their middle 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Jazz men don't do that. They hurt themselves. Unless you're a person like Benny Carter mm -hmm. and Sweet Edison. Well, you know, Benny Carter dedicated himself to playing, writing, taking care of himself. Mm -hmm. And at 85, he's still a brilliant, wonderful musician to be envied. Mm -hmm. now, what's the best thing uh, a musician today can do to develop the sound? I know the best thing for me has been to study with you and try and work on the techniques and the uh, just the technical aspects of what you're trying to teach. But what, outside of studying that and working on that and trying to deal with all the other factors in your life, what are the best things we can do as musicians, saxophone players, to find our sound, develop our sound? Well, some of the things we should do, first of all, in my opinion, is to get very serious and have as much respect for yourself and your instrument as a cellist or a violinist or a piano does, pianist. They have a lot of respect for it. Uh, then the art of listening should be developed, like you should listen to uh, famous concert artists. You should listen to very important music and see, listen to the sounds that are made. Because that's all composers are doing. They're, they're making sounds and making uh, uh, phrases that are important. They're making music. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the important thing is remember that's the first thing you're supposed to do is make music, make sound. Now, one of the reasons that I like teaching so much is that I hope my students will go out and be as serious about their teaching as I am so that I know that my students are, are, have a lot of respect for themselves and their horns now, which means they never treat it lightly or, or trivially anymore. They really, they're looking at that instrument and they're making demands on themselves like a real, honest musician should make. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't get smug. He takes nothing for granted. He doesn't think he's good. He always thinks he can get better. Mm -hmm. And sound is a very investigative kind of thing. It's worth talking a lot about with other peers mm -hmm. and see what their ideas are and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I remember when I grew up, I'd come down from a lesson, and Coleman Hawkins, who was absolutely famous then, you buy reeds in Silverman Hall. Mm -hmm. Also, Wingy Minot would be on the corner. Mm -hmm. Also, there'd be Fats Waller. Mm -hmm. Also, I'd see the famous saxophone players going across the streets to Selmer. Mm -hmm. These guys would stop me and say, how are your lessons going? Mm -hmm. You know? And I, I'd say, wow, Coleman Hawkins has asked me how my lessons are going. I'm curious. Curious. He said, what are you studying? And Fats Wallace said, kid, I see you every week. You're serious about your playing. You're studying a lot, huh? I said, yeah, I can play your song. Yeah, he said, you can? Yeah, I, I can play your song. <laughs> and he, he got a big kick out of that. Which one? Honeysuckle Rose. Okay. And, uh, and he used to stand there swinging his, his chain and his pork pie. But... Every, every week he'd be there, he'd engage me in conversation, and Coleman was very interested in what I was doing. And then a, um, a very serious saxophone player by name, I think his name was Hilton Jefferson, was studying with Henry. Mm -hmm. And he was with, I think that was his name, I'm trying to remember. And he was with the Cab Calloway's band. And we were both so enthusiastic about what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And he, he, generally, I feel, he took it back to the band. Mm -hmm. And I, he introduced me way back to... Uh, Cab Calloway, Chew Berry, these are Joe famous guys in the band, mm -hmm. you know, Dizzy Gillespie. And, uh, and I'm sure that the subject of how you use your fingers came up. Because mm -hmm. if you just look at the way Dizzy's fingers go, they're so quiet when he played a million notes. Look at the way uh, Charlie Parker's fingers go. Mm -hmm. They hardly move them. He learned that from Lester. Mm -hmm. And that, that, 
That's a technique that very few people understand. When my students see Phil Wood's fingers hardly moving, mm -hmm. and Charlie Parker say, gee, Phil, you're right, their fingers don't move. It's like, you know, uh, uh, they think I was kidding them or something, or lying, or, or making something up. Mm -hmm. But there are very few people who take the motion of the fingers that seriously and understand the use of the fingers. A violinist does. Mm -hmm. In those days, too, the the whole thing was about your sound. Everything was and sound. And how individual you were. Absolutely. You know, I, I think that, too, a lot of our problem today is we have a... He's calling us, the camera's going out. Uh, I was going to ask you, uh, in your day, the sound was everything. Uh, a person's individuality, their style, but mostly their sound. And one thing you taught me to listen for was if you go back and listen to all the people who you deem as great or who you love, it's not what they play as much as it is the sound they played it with. I think uh, what's been lost a lot today is there's so many technical demands placed on us as far as the amount of instruments they want to play, the amount of styles we should be proficient in. It's, it becomes very hard for me personally to focus on just finding my sound, my style, what, who I really am as a player, and what I want to say. What can we do to, to uh, find our sound today, well, I times think being the way they are? You've, you're, you're really posing a very interesting and important question, no doubt about it. But if, again, in my opinion, all instruments are played alike, if you have gotten to the point where you have really conquered that, uh, that any one horn and you are using everything correctly, it will not make any difference what horn you go to. But I do think that you also posed another question. When a person has to play so many horns to stay in a business or to be called for work, before he's ready to play any of the horns, actually, then he is, you know, like spreading himself so thin. And that's why I make most of the students go to this alto saxophone, even though they're tenor, mm -hmm. after they've played the tenor for a while. Because every one of the problems is highlighted in an alto saxophone, mm -hmm. which you might get away with a little bit in a tenor, mm -hmm. and can get away with a lot on the baritone. Mm -hmm. And you can't get away with a single note on the soprano. Uh, it is the closest, the alto is the closest thing to a fiddle where the sound is noticed immediately. Like if a violinist has a bad sound suddenly, you hear it immediately. Jack Benny used to make fun of it all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have that problem because there is right now a split in saxophone thinking. A lot of saxophonists don't want to play with vibrato. Because, since Bach, you don't need all of that sound, in your, the, uh, the vibrato in your voice. Yet, to develop a tone, you first have to start with the vibrato, like the violin, mm -hmm. in order to understand the breadth of a sound, the beginning and ending of a sound. Mm -hmm. It's like Isaac Stern recently on an interview was asked, what does he listen to when he plays music? And he stumped for a minute, got a little smile on his face and said, I listen to what happens between the notes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the sound is. It's between the notes. Mm -hmm. And just to understand that a note has a beginning and an end, that's the way you develop a sound, just to start with there. If you just do where the beginning is. Mm -hmm. Or Lyndon used to say to me, you're landing on the note. You're squashing it flat, mm -hmm. which we didn't want to hear from him, mm -hmm. because he had a big habit of yanking the horn out of your mouth <laughs> as we made a mistake. Or if you didn't put the finger down, he'd bang your finger down, put it down. And then and he hurt my mouth sometimes. Oh, I'm really sorry to say, bang, back in the mouth and off you went. Couldn't care less. It was really funny. But he was so intense. <laughs> and I understood that. But you know, intuitively, I think, I didn't know what he was saying. Mm -hmm. But I knew that every time I did exactly what he said, something good happened. Mm -hmm. And I could tell, God, I wish I could do that all the time. I got some sound by putting my finger down that certain way. What was it I did? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Well, 
he was constantly saying things like, the sound is in the bell, not in you. You hear today, guys are trying to make a sound. Make it. You, nobody can make a sound. Mm -hmm. I always say, you can't make anybody love you. You can allow that to happen. You can open yourself up. But you can't make it happen. And so, uh, I had to learn what that meant. Don't make a sound. That means, don't play the horn from your mouth. Mm -hmm. Play it from your fingers. Mm -hmm. Because that's the message. There's no message up here. Here's the message. Play it with your fingers. Well, you know, you just go back to a great Sokovia. Mm -hmm. You watch his fingers. Mm -hmm. And that, that you're fascinated by, you don't look at him or anything, you just watch his fingers play the instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, you look at the bird play, Charlie Parker, and you're fascinated with his fingers. You can't tell if he's playing slow or fast. Right. Well, that's a skill. And that's what Lyndon was teaching. Mm -hmm. He was teaching a skill. Mm -hmm. He didn't care what you were going to do with it. He thought that he could make anybody play an instrument. Well, I feel the same way. That doesn't mean that you can become great, but anybody can learn to play an instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a wonderful book I think everybody should read called All Thumbs and Tone Deaf. Mm -hmm. And it's by a neurologist, a doctor in San Francisco in the UC Medicine School. Mm -hmm. He's a professor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't start to take music up between 45 and 50, I think. Mm -hmm. And the way he talks about it is, is fabulous. It's changed his life. He thinks everybody from the age of 45 on should study an instrument. Mm -hmm. Because it'll make you healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, again, that's the part I'm missing with the students that are, with the players today. They are not doing the healthy thing. Mm -hmm. They're not getting inside themselves. It's too much external playing. And that's not very satisfying, really. Mm -hmm. It's when you're truly in touch with yourself that it really begins to happen. It's like, it took me a long time to really love the Duke Ellington band. Mm -hmm. But it's because they were really getting to it. And I hadn't learned to get to it myself yet, so how could I get to the Ellington band? I couldn't. The most basic thing was like the Basie band, you could understand them quite quite well right away. Mm -hmm. More primitive. But the Ellington band went so deep, and the players did, all of them. Well, they know who they were. I don't know how many people, I think Phil Woods might know who he is a bit. He's, he was a serious player, he is a serious player, and um, he he, his role models were uh, Johnny Hodges, Benny Carter, the uh, role models, uh, and Charlie Parker. And that's pretty good, you know. And he still feels that way. So if you listen to him play, you hear a very, very personal sound, mm -hmm. very ringing sound. Mm -hmm. And that was Lindemann who always said, make that bell ring. That's where the note is, not in you, it's in the bell. Mm -hmm. See that it rings. Well, if you just did that, you'd be doing something fascinating to discover how that works. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize until one of my students whose father is a kind of a physicist, that when Lyndon was saying, put your finger down slowly mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't come up that fast, I didn't realize it was a law of physics mm -hmm. until my student told me that. Now, how does the finger movement affect pitch? Well, if you guide the air to the note very smoothly, absolutely the timing is exactly right, mm -hmm. you're going to get a much better tone and a pitch than if you jump in a note. Mm -hmm. It might be too late to fix anything about it. And there is also something, I'm not too sure about it myself, but Lindemann used to say to me, something like, not very often, but I, I remembered it, he said, I'm not worried about your intonation, I'm worried about the pitch of the sound. Mm -hmm. And that got me, you know. And finally, every night he said, I like that pitch you're playing with. And I realized he wasn't talking about intonation, he was talking about the sound itself. It was either dead or alive, mm -hmm. or it was ringing or it wasn't ringing, things like that. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I began to hear that. Said, oh boy. Now, the reason I knew it was right is because when I was a kid and I would go into the NOLA studios, 
uh, to audition for a band. Well, I was scared most of the time. These guys were ripping off a mile a minute with notes with their fingers. And I start to walk out once of a big band, and the leader said, hey, kid, come back here. Did you bring your horn to play? I said, yeah, but I said, these, these guys are good. I'll see you later. He said, no, you come in and play. And I sat down to play, and he says, I want you to do the job. And the other guy said, geez, why, why, why would you want him? He says, his sound is so good. He can learn the part. He'll learn it. But that sound is what I want. And the sound is where we get the pitch from, isn't it? That's where it comes from. If you have a bad sound, how could you have intonation? Good intonation. You have uh, to have the bottom of the note. You have to have the bottom of the note to play it right. And how few people think of going to the bottom of the note? They go to center. Well, you get the center by going to the bottom. Mm -hmm. How do you know where the center is? I, I think we have talked about this a great deal. That a cellist and a violinist, they see their bow. They are taught physically what to do with that bow. Mm -hmm. Most upbeats start with an up bow for them. And they are taught to use that. Mm -hmm. We have only an air column. We can't see it. Yet we have to manipulate it just as well as when, as if we had a bow in our hand. Mm -hmm. You see. Mm -hmm. Now, most people have no idea what their air is doing and they have never learned to see it. I see my air current. Mm -hmm. I try to make it analogous to my to a bow in my mind. Mm -hmm. So it's the connection between the fingers, between the notes. Right. Because actually, if you're low, doing very slow photography process, you would see the finger come down just a fraction before the air comes in. Because the finger should be leading the air right to that note. Not the reverse, which a lot of people are doing. They're blowing the note, and then their fingers can't do what they want them to do. Mm -hmm. I've seen this with an awful lot of musicians, good players, mm -hmm. who's, who get the idea and the thing and the sound from up here before their finger plays it from their mouth. Right, they're hearing it before they're they play. They're way before they play it. Yeah. And they try to play it up here before they finger it. Mm -hmm. It can't off work. The air, because the now throat. you're talking about timing. Yeah. And all art is a matter of timing. I mean, all you have to do, you don't remember, but people who remember George Burns, he's still alive doing his thing, mm -hmm. you know that he does, doesn't say very much. Mm -hmm. But when he times that certain word a certain way, they, and people break up. Mm -hmm. It's just recently I, I was listening to myself play and listening to my students, and I think we've been talking about it recently, where I suddenly realized Lindemann had a saying about hyphens. He doesn't play all the notes. He never misses the notes he has to play. Suddenly, I reduced that this week myself to saying, wait a minute, that's like saying true. That if you look at a sentence, there are a lot of ifs, so, but, then, because. Now those are important words to say, like all the notes are, but there may be one word like reprehensible or you're irresponsible, which takes precedent over if, mm -hmm. and but, and, and so. And that's what Lindemann was trying to say. There are some notes you must play. Mm -hmm. Because his development of the idea was that if you played a very good note, where you put your finger down absolutely correctly, mm -hmm. that the next note would be a very good note. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, the note after it could be a very bad note because you misplaced the air. Now you're always saying that we play backwards. We play the high notes too loud, we play the low notes too soft, we play the long notes too long and the short notes too short. Right. How do we reverse our thinking? Well I think the first thing that happens is to realize that your hands, you're always grabbing something. You grab the steering wheel, you grab your horn, you grab the doorknob, you pick up a pot. You're always closing your hands, but eventually your hands are always open. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that the fingers don't want to stay down. They want to come up. Mm -hmm. So when you give a student Lindemann's first exercise, which is A to B, strictly a group of 16th notes, mm -hmm. and you say, play that for me. He goes, da-da, 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 da-da. And so you hear it. You say, I wonder why he goes, da-da, da-da, and so going, da-da, 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 da-da. And most people don't know they're doing it. Now, what happens is the air hasn't had a chance to go into the first note 
but it's exploding on the second note. So based on that theory, Lindemann said, we are all playing the open note way too loud, way too long, and we're not playing the finger we put down. So he based everything first, you had to learn how to put your fingers down. Because mm -hmm. if you didn't, you couldn't logically play an open note. My baseball coach used to tell me I, threw, I was throwing the ball before I caught it. That's it. That's it. So they still say that he took his eye off the ball. Yeah. That means he's doing something before he catches the ball. He's doing something else. You got to catch the ball first. You're playing the second out before you before, play the first. Before, wait, before. Back to what you said about yeah. entrances being the most important thing. Uh, incidentally, and, and this uh, uh, on the tape, I think it should be an important statement is that Heifetz had a saying I don't hold anything because music is made up of entrances and then we all have to find out what does that mean it's made up of entrances and then how we delineate that idea that's clear to us mm -hmm. then the more entrances you can apply to the music and, and have it work well well you're going to be a better player you don't miss the first note the first word in the sentence it's like he used to say you didn't say the first word in the sentence. I didn't hear you. Missed it. Yeah. You see. And then, of course, what do you mean you don't hold anything? A student will immediately say, well, it's Fort Beach. you got to hold it, don't you? And everybody's, and I always say, yeah, I really do know that. I know it's four beats. But the idea is to set the, the four beats in motion immediately. Mm -hmm. So that if I can create motion in the student right away, he's going to be much better than anybody else, no matter what. He may not even read as well, but he, he will read better much in a shorter time mm -hmm. than anybody else because he sees things more clearly. He's looking at it way before the person who's still looking at the long tone. That's so interesting because you always tell us, don't play in rhythm. You yell at me, I've heard it a thousand times. I don't care about the rhythm. I care about the sound of the notes well, and the motion. Well, I would, I would correct you just briefly. I do care about the rhythm. I don't care about the tempo. That's what I meant. Yeah, because the tempo, I've seen it in some of the finest players. I had a big example this week, a very fine player, who just blew my ears out. I couldn't stand what he did. Mm -hmm. He suddenly, after a really good lesson, he played something in tempo. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. And it played so badly, had nothing to do with what he had just played for the last 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I realized, when Lindemann said to me, I don't want you to play in tempo. Mm -hmm. That we are ruled by tempo, which is the problem. The concert players aren't. Everything is rubato to them. Haifa said everything is rubato. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to conceptualize again, because mm -hmm. he's playing, you know, some things that are really in tempo. That's tempo. He doesn't think in those terms. In other words, Lindemann said tempo will always hurt you. Well, you see, we are all brought up in the dance field. Tempo is everything to us, the right tempo to the tune. Mm -hmm. And so we try to fit things to tempo. Mm -hmm. My analogy there is to say that rhythm structure is the first thing in music, mm -hmm. the same as the foundation to a house. Mm -hmm. Tempos are like putting the paint on if the house is built. Mm -hmm. It'll never make the house a better house, only more attractive, mm -hmm. but not better, because it's not going to stop the house from crumbling paint. Mm -hmm. And tempo, the same. If the rhythm structures are correct in music, you are going to be almost always right because that rhythm can be played at lots of tempos, mm -hmm. like there are lots of color, color paints. Speaking of colors, I'd like uh, you to tell us about your group, the West Coast Sax Quartet. The group, uh, the thing that everybody talks about is the wide variety of colors you get and the incredible sound of four saxophones all playing with the same concept of playing the instrument? Well, it came about probably because my thinking changed when my wife became really ill. Values changed, what I thought about, what's really important. And suddenly I realized I was making a lot of money in, uh, as a studio musician. And pretty well thought of, and, and thinking I was pretty good because I was a studio musician, because they were always a studio musician. Uh, and I suddenly heard lots of studio musicians that I didn't think were that great. But then, 
Mitchell Lurie one day said to me, uh, I'm going to leave the studios, Phil. I, I, I'm not satisfied here. I just have to play. He said, I think you should get out too. I hope you do. Well, it was very difficult to give up the money and, and feel secure that I could make it without being in the studios. And um, I decided finally, it took me almost five years, four years from the time he told me to do it. And my son had also said something interesting. He said, you've done it all, Dad. Why don't you just do what you want to do now? Mm -hmm. So I recruited two students of mine and a very good friend and a terrific musician by the name of Pete Terry. And we were very good friends and he was interested in the Lindemann system. And it thrilled him later in life to find out what it was like. Anyhow, we played. And my objective was, we discussed it. My objective was to say, you think it's possible for a saxophone quartet to play with the same kind of enthusiasm, integrity, and honesty, and skill that the Guarneri String Quartet plays with. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh boy, you're not asking much, are you? I said, it's just a standard to look up to. Mm -hmm. We may never get there, but what a fun thing to try. Mm -hmm. Well, Leo Potts had come back from studying the Paris Conservatory and now was studying with me. So he knew quite a bit about the quartet music and stuff like that. Very helpful. Chris Bleth was a student and I knew he had a tremendous amount of talent. He didn't believe it, but I knew it. Very self-effacing young man. He's only starting to realize he's good now. He's a wonderful person. And Pete wanted to play it desperately, and I played it. I wanted it, and I, and also I had been playing the soprano in the Laughing Show, and that started me to say, "Wait, this is a tough instrument." Mm -hmm. I was making fun of it on the Laughing Show, but here I really had to play it, and I really fell in love with it. And so we started, and uh, we had a lot of rehearsals and a lot of philosophical discussions mm -hmm. about how you do it. And my point was, I do not want to be a commercial quartet, because you could do that. Mm -hmm. I said, no, let's see how much we can expand our musical knowledge, our abilities, our skills, and s just stretch out as much as we can musically. Mm -hmm. That was a real goal of mm -hmm. ours. Mm -hmm. Pete was a an, an wonderful musician, and he played the baritone was a great help. Mm -hmm. And we studied the music quite hard, and we realized what we were going to have to do. And the first thing I said is, look, it. our sound is different from anybody else's sound. It's a combination of very good studying and Pete and I have a very long standing of jazz background, mm -hmm. which we try to incorporate, which is that richness of sound that I don't hear in classical players, and I still don't. And. Uh, and, and incorporate that part of the classical playing that we all studied, Lindemann system, so to speak, into playing these tough things mm -hmm. and learning how to play them through the system, which was intriguing. It was tough because we were about to be judged on other aspects of playing other than what we were doing. We didn't play fast enough, some people would say. Uh, uh, we uh, were too much into the sound of the playing and not more into the technique of the playing. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, that's basically what we're trying to do is to develop a sound so the group has its own particular sound. It's the first thing we want to do is develop that thing where somebody would say, it's an instrument playing, not four, mm -hmm. which is what you hear with the Guarneri String Quartet. It's one instrument. And it's been absolutely the most intriguing for all of us. We've had some tough times yelling at each other, which is all right, you know. And I, and because I, as a teacher, I sometimes tend to be too tough on the quartet. Mm -hmm. But uh, in order to be a good musician, I feel one has to be vulnerable. You cannot stand in denial. You have to be able to take criticism, and you have to be able to give it as well and uh, not get upset by it, because that's how you learn. And that's what makes truly a much better musician, mm -hmm. 
is the ability to open up and take your beating and go. That's why studying is so important, because the teacher's going to beat you up. Anyhow, we've gone through stages, different things, and it, uh, we made our, our first album, and it was very good. Pete was on it. Uh, we played one of the most difficult things that any quartet can play, and very few are still playing it. They won't play it. The Creston Suite for saxophones. Pete was difficult because Pete didn't like new music. He hated it. And we loved it, we wanted to, but I wanted to play everything. Anyhow, we began suddenly to develop a cohesiveness, even on that first album. And we got a pretty good writer, considering what we did. It's great album. Yeah. And we did it in a, in a room, somebody's room. Uh, Hal Heidi was kind enough not to charge us a dime mm -hmm. and did our recording, because he was as interested as we were. He had a, a setup and he was trying to do that. But then last year, the saxophone quartet went to play in New York. We were invited to play at Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. for to introduce uh, a premiere, a work by Al Kryzak, a guitar player who wrote this absolutely ridiculously hard, fun, impossible piece to play. Mm -hmm. And he was premiering his works in Carnegie Hall. And this was one of them, and he asked us if we do it. Mm -hmm. So we did it. And it forced us to play over our heads. Because when we first played it, we said, let's tear it up and throw it away. But the guy happened to be calling at the time that we were tearing it up. And he said, hey, have you played the piece? And I lied and said, oh yeah. He said, would you do me a favor and make a tape of it? Now he had me against the wall. And I said, well, yeah, I think we'll, well, okay, we'll, we'll send you a tape. And he said, oh, by the way, how would you like to play Carnegie Hall? We're pre premier that work in Carnegie Hall. Well, I said, of course. Now we're caught. <laughs> we could get out of it. But it was great because it was a growing up period. We had to do something we didn't like. We weren't even able to play it well. But we had to rehearse it to within an inch of our lives till finally we could play it. Mm -hmm. Growing up time. It's like people playing the soccer to prime time the first time. Then we played another concert for Yamaha, mm -hmm. and something happened, and it was an intangible thing. The quartet, woo, we came together. Mm -hmm. And I said, boy, we are making a statement for the first time in our lives. We must make an album right now. And we did make the album, and it really, it really did exactly what I thought it would do. It, it's a beautiful album, proud of it. Uh, the playing is exquisite, the recording is exquisite, right. and it's a different, it's a different saxophone album. It's different from anything anybody's ever made. There's not a gimmick on it. Mm -hmm. There is tremendous amount of virtuoso playing, mm -hmm. of skill on the album. And thank God the, the uh, recorder had great skill in, in doing it. And it's something I will be proud of for the rest of my life, and I'm, now I'm looking forward to doing more of the same thing because the barriers have been broken down between between the four guys in the group, and everybody. You had a personnel change, excuse me. Yes, we did have one personnel change. Pete left to move to Montana, and I moved uh, uh, Chris Bleth, who was playing the tenor, to the baritone, and I put another student of mine, uh, a remarkably good player, uh, Mark Costner, on the tenor, and I must say, uh, uh, the group has really grown since then immeasurably, and. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is I wanted to open up the idea that you can't be nice to each other in a group. Four disparate temperaments and personalities mm -hmm. that will meld to make a particular sound. Mm -hmm. Only if we all understand everybody's got the right to be who he wants and say what he wants. Mm -hmm. Even though it might be something, well, I don't like the way you played that. Why didn't you play it this way? Fine. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're always out of tune on that one note. Mm -hmm. So. You have to work through that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I did something once. I, I attacked one of the guys, and it hurt him very much. Mm -hmm. But he had to work through it. Mm -hmm. And he has worked through it. And it took him over a year. Mm -hmm. And just last week, in rehearsal, he said, Boy, I'm, 
I'm a lot different than I was. And boy, it thrilled all of us. He said, I guess I had to go through some tough times to be able to laugh at some things I couldn't laugh at. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Because when you're dealing in music, it's a philosophical and psychological thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the actual fact of reading and counting music that's not such a big thing. Mm -hmm. well, the kids can do it in, you know, in high school and junior high. That's not the problem. The problem is presenting your deepest feelings on the instrument when you play it so that you can communicate to the listener. Mm -hmm. That's the name of the game. Mm -hmm. And that's what all we're really doing now is trying to make a sound that communicates itself to the listener, whether it's modern or not. Mm -hmm. And we, we played last week a workshop at Valley College for the American Society of Musical Arrangers and Composers. And a lot of very important composers were there. Mm -hmm. And one of them came down to me and said, that's a remarkable sound. Mm -hmm. He said, it sounds like, like, like a hole in the ground and the four guys are feeding the sound in the hole in the ground and now out comes the sound. It's, and I can't tell you, it's not any instrument, it's the sound of one instrument. He said, it's so powerful and gorgeous, it's an incredible sound. Well, then we have accomplished something, if we can do that. Mm -hmm. That's really something. That means that we have our own sound, our own style, and if we get a chance to play it, you know, in, in broader terms, which I hope we will get to do, uh, 